Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. No matter where you are on the planet, welcome to Sustainability in Your Ear. This is the podcast conversation about accelerating the transition to a sustainable, carbon-neutral society, and I'm your host, Mitch Ratcliffe. Thanks for joining the conversation today. Geothermal energy is typically associated with high temperatures and geologically active areas, such as hot springs or locations at the intersections of tectonic plates. But the Earth's outer crust, just a dozen or so feet below the surface, remains at a consistent temperature of 55 degrees year-round. That's an untapped source of heating and cooling capacity for homes. By pumping a heat-conductive fluid back and forth between a house and the ground, we can keep a home at a stable, comfortable temperature in hot or cold weather. Our guest today is Kathy Hannon. She's president and co-founder of Dandelion Energy. The company, which was spun out of Google X Lab, is transforming the heating and cooling choices available to homeowners. Dandelion Energy specializes in residential geothermal pumps. Their system includes a heat pump inside the home and a buried pipe system called a ground loop that transfers heat to or from the building. Geothermal energy is more efficient, cost-effective, and environmentally friendly compared to traditional furnaces, offering benefits like lower operating costs and reduced environmental impact. Dandelion Energy also emphasizes the safety because its heat pump does not rely on natural gas that can leak or explode, and they emphasize the longevity of their systems, which it says is the most efficient and sustainable way to manage home temperatures. You can learn more about Dandelion Energy at dandelionenergy.com. Dandelion Energy is all one word, no space, no dash, dandelionenergy.com. Now, let's take a quick commercial break before we get to the conversation. Welcome to the show, Kathy. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining us. Now, where are you calling from? You, you, your company has a lot of business in the Northeast. Are you up there? Um, I go there often. I'm headed out actually next week, but right now I'm calling in from the Bay Area, California. Ah, okay. So you're kind of in the Google, Google space uh, near the X Lab? <laughs> I guess I am still. Yes, I am located near there. Well, I wanted to start off, if you could explain how Dandelion Energy's geothermal heat pump differ both from traditional heating and cooling systems and the heat pumps that most people think of when they talk about them. Sure. So a geothermal heat pump is a heat pump, and we'll get into that, mm -hmm. connected to what are called ground loops, which are actually just plastic pipes that are buried under the yard. And these pipes go vertically, at least the ones Dandelion installs, about mm -hmm. 300 to 500 feet deep. So they're actually pretty thin. They're inch and a half pipes, but they're okay. going deep into the ground and they circulate water. And that water becomes the temperature of the ground as it travels through those pipes. And then it goes into the heat pump and the heat pump is designed to take that heat out of the water concentrate it or boost the temperature and then use that heat to heat the house. And in the summer, the whole system works in reverse and the heat pump takes heat out of the air in your house, which is exactly what an air conditioner does. But instead of pushing that heat into the air outside your house, like an air conditioner would, the mm -hmm. geothermal heat pump is instead pushing that heat into the water, which then circulates through the ground, through those pipes and disperses that heat into the ground. So this is clearly very different than a typical conventional heating system, which just sure. burns a fuel for heat. Um, and it's also different than an air source heat pump, which is what I would say most people are probably thinking of when they think of heat pump. An air source heat pump is essentially an air conditioner that can do heating in addition to cooling. So, you know, it's, it's obvious that pumping 55 degree fluid into a home can cool it. And essentially the 55 degree heat can be condensed just like it's sort of the inverse of a refrigerator to warm the house to a room temperature. That's right. Yes, exactly. Um, you're not using the 55 degree water directly. You're mm -hmm. um, using that heat pump to either concentrate that heat, if you will, or take the 55 degree heat, but then make a hundred degree air in the case uh -huh. of heating. Or as you said, it's more intuitive to think about how you could take heat from the house and then, you know, dump it into 55 degree water. 
So how does Dandelion Energy's approach contribute to the energy efficiency and cost of warming and cooling a house for a homeowner? Can you characterize generally the savings that that produces? Yeah. Well, when we think about efficiency of a heating system, you're mm -hmm. really thinking about what is the ratio of useful heat provided to the house over the total energy used to make that happen. So for a typical fuel oil furnace or natural gas furnace, you, you have efficiencies anywhere from like 70 to 95%. And it's because you're never going to translate 100% of the energy um, in that fuel to useful heat energy in the house. For a geothermal heat pump, the efficiencies are literally 400%, sometimes mm -hmm. even 500%. And to many scientifically minded people, that sounds impossible because how can efficiency be more than 100%, right? But th the answer is it's because the um, the energy or the electricity used to run the geothermal heat pump, it's not being, um, the electricity itself is not being used for heat. The, right. That electricity is being used to move heat that already exists in the ground into your house. And so for every one unit, let's say, of electricity used to run the system, you're moving four units of ground thermal energy into the house. So you're mm -hmm. able to deliver a lot more heating than you are, you know, you as you know, at proportionally to how much energy you're using. So anyway, what this translates to is the most efficient way possible to heat and cool your home. But also, um, it's a lot less expensive because you're only paying for that one unit of electricity. The four units of ground energy you don't need to pay for because that's just ground energy in your yard. So, so would you say that it costs eighty percent less uh, based on the numbers you just shared uh, to heat your home or cool your home? It's anywhere from thirty to seventy percent less. But I, the reason it's such a huge range is that mm -hmm. the um, cost decrease is a function of what were you paying for fuel to sure. heat your home before. So, of course, the cost of natural gas in Pennsylvania is going to be very different than the cost of fuel oil in Maine. Mm -hmm. And then what um, what do you pay for electricity? Because if electricity is inexpensive, then that one unit of electricity you need to move the heat will cost you less, of course. So it's it, it depends on local factors. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, if I switch from something that's incredibly expensive, just it's going to be a bigger savings. But exactly. So the other thinking about that, then it sounds like the only carbon emissions associated with this would be the carbon generated by the generation of the electricity driving the pump. Is that also correct? That is correct. And so some of our homeowners use solar to right run their home electricity and then they're net zero because, well, not just net zero, they're burning nothing, right? If you can oh. use renewable energy to move that heat renewably, then you're not emitting any carbon. So if we were to combine renewable energy with geothermal heating and cooling, we literally could have a completely net uh, neutral home or even potentially carbon positive. I would say neutral. I mean, carbon yeah. positive if you're generating excess solar, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the other thing to note about geothermal is that because you're using the ground, which is a stable temperature year round, as your thermal store, if you will, mm -hmm. you really avoid a lot of the peak issues that you see on the grid that are weather driven. So the hottest day of the summer, all the air conditioners are working least efficiently. Sure. Your geothermal system doesn't have to push heat into a hundred degree air outside. It's just pushing it into the ground. And similarly, in the depths of winter, if you have an air source heat pump, it might be using the most electricity it's going to use. The geothermal system, again, is insulated from that mm -hmm. out cold. And this also makes geothermal systems much uh, more compatible with renewables on the grid because you don't have to deal with those huge peak periods to right. the same extent. And it's hard for renewables to deal with those peaks. Um, 
So a lot of policymakers see geothermal as a key tool in helping that transition to a more renewable grid. And just to be clear, this could be done anywhere because of the consistent temperature of the Earth's crust. Unlike the geothermal used to create electricity, where you only have certain parts of the world that mm -hmm. have the right geology to make that feasible with geothermal heat pumps, you're really just using the very surface of the ground and you don't you don't need anything special. So you can do this pretty much anywhere, which is a nice uh, feature. Uh, absolutely. Now, now that we understand how this works, tell us how you started the company. I mean, you, you came out of Google. What was involved in, well, first, what made you think, gee, I want to start a geothermal heat pump company? The um, My interest in geothermal really was just born out of um, a deepening understanding of how we as a society use energy and where our emissions are coming from. Mm -hmm. And buildings are just responsible for such a large fraction of emissions in the United States. And most of that is heating and cooling. And when you learn about what we could do to get fossil fuels out of heating, heat pumps are really uh, the answer. Like there really aren't a lot of competing technologies to heat pumps that make sense. A lot of the focus is on air source heat pumps because you don't exactly. need ground loops. And I think that air source heat pumps make a lot of sense in a lot of places. And I'm a huge fan, but I grew up in New Hampshire. I grew up in a fuel oil house. So maybe I just had uh, an intuitive appreciation for the idea that if you have an air source heat pump, your electric, you know, because of thermodynamics, it's always going to be relatively energy intensive to pull heat out of very, very cold air. And you have a lot of old homes in the Northeast where it's, uh, they're not the most energy efficient. So air source heat pump technology has gotten better and better. And it's so impressive, like how quickly that's come along. But the more I learned about the problem, the more I thought, what if we could just make it easier and less expensive to put in these ground loops? Sure. That's like an alternative path that if you could just make the ground loop problem easier, you get a huge efficiency benefit, which is right. environmentally favorable, but also results in much lower cost for the homeowner for the lifetime of their system. Mm -hmm. And um, once you install those ground loops in a building, they'll last pretty much forever. So it's like a one-time cost with indefinite benefit. Anyway, and like not, not, from what I could see, a lot of research dollars and a lot of talented people were working on the air source problem. And I didn't really see a lot of activity on the ground source side. So it just seemed like, wow, there might be a real opportunity here to just invest in making this technology more of a consumer-friendly product. Uh -huh. And this could just be an alternative path to uh, decarbonizing buildings. So were you at Google or did you take this to Google X Lab and pitch it to them? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Th thanks for clarifying. I was at Google at the time, at X, and my job was find new projects for X to work on. So it was in that capacity that I was um, doing this investigation into geothermal heat pumps and why they were such a niche product despite all of their benefits. And then as I learned more and more, it just um, became sort of apparent that this was a type of initiative that could be potentially better accomplished as a startup than within a research lab, because so much of it has to do with commercializing a product and uh, taking it out into the world and you know, learning by doing. So we spun it. How did you how do you how did you establish the product market fit um, for Google's purposes? I mean, you know, because I've been through the pitch process many times. What did you tell the Google team to justify the funding? Yeah. Of the company of Dandelion. Well, at the beginning, uh, when it was a project within X, the uh, pitch was really about analysis, like looking at what assumptions would we need to be believe are true about the cost up front of geothermal to make it 
sort of an obvious economic decision to do geothermal instead of another heating system. And we built conviction that, yeah, this is actually doable. We can, we can get these systems to a price where it just makes financial sense for people to choose this technology. Then we spun it out. And one of the most difficult things about raising my first round of seed funding was convincing investors that there would be product market fit because I didn't have proof of that. Like I had the analysis, but that's very different as most, you know, most people who have tried something like this would tell you than actually showing people paying real money for a product. Right. So our main, um, task after that first round of seed funding was to show exactly that, that if we offered this product, which we did in upstate New York, mm -hmm. people would actually buy it and want it. How long did it take from the launch to getting that proof of, of concept? It wasn't long. So we got the funding in July of 2017, and we were installing the first systems, I believe, in September but wow. yeah, but a lot of the work we did at the beginning, because we were just um, experimenting with pricing, product market fit, business model, a lot of those things, we pieced together a lot of off the shelf um, components to the offering. So we were able to get up and running really quickly. And then we sort of um, leafed in our improvements as we went. It seems like the, the, the biggest challenge, because of course, you know, almost off the shelf, a heat pump can do what you're describing. It was the ground uh, installation yeah. that was, so how did you figure out how to put a pipe 300 feet into the ground? Yeah, that was the biggest challenge at the beginning. And I'll just start by saying you, there are uh, drilling contractors all over the country that can do geothermal ground loops. A lot of people are using water well rigs and water well rigs don't fit in a lot of um, people's yards, which is a right. limitation and they can create quite a mess, which is another challenge, um, but they do exist and they do get the ground loops in the ground. So what we started with was a mix of subcontractors that could do water well or geothermal. And then we also, from the beginning had our own um, smaller, more residentially friendly rig that we were using. And over the years, we've just learned a lot about what, what drilling technologies are best suited for this problem. And we've really expanded our fleet of rigs so that today we do all of our own drilling instead of relying on water wells. Water so wells. You still, at least according to your site, you've installed about 1,200 heat pumps in New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. What are your plans for geographic expansion? And and it sounds like installation capacity or partnerships with installers is the gating factor. Is that correct? Today, we have a vertically integrated model. So we our employees do the drilling and the installation. Okay. Um, we are expanding geographically when it comes to our new construction line of business. So we partner with builders and developers to put geothermal into new homes. Mm -hmm. In terms of our retrofit business, um, we, yeah, I think one of the one of the nice things actually about this business is that the market is so large. There are just so many homes that, and all the homes need heating and cooling that we haven't had to we've been able to strategically focus on certain geographies and just really um, honing our operations and our model. And we haven't needed to expand super quickly because we've been able to increase our business and our revenue within these geographic areas, which is actually very helpful with such an operationally intensive business as ours. So we do aspire obviously to geographically expand, but we're not we're able to grow our business in our current footprint efficiently. So that's, that's been our strategy to date. It's good not to be in a hurry, but uh, uh, there's so much I want to dig into here. This is a great conversation. We need to take a quick commercial break. We will be right back. 
Now let's return to the conversation with Kathy Hannon. She is CEO of Dandelion Energy. They're a developer of geothermal heat pumps for the home. These devices, which rely on the consistent temperature of the ground under our feet, can be used basically anywhere. So, Kathy, let's talk about cost. What what does is there one size system that fits all homes, or are there different sizes? And what would those costs look like for somebody considering upgrading their home heating with or, and cooling with uh, dandelion? Yeah, there are. It's not one size fits all. So part of our process is we'll go to the home and do a design. So we mm -hmm. measure basically how much heating and cooling will this home require over the course of a year which is a function of the weather in that location, the size of the home, how leaky it is, a bunch of factors like that. Mm -hmm. And then we'll size the system appropriately. The cost, 70% uh, of our homeowners pay nothing up front and pay monthly with mm -hmm. a loan, okay. kind of like the rooftop solar industry model, and 30% pay cash. So um, for those who pay up front, the net cost to the customer after incentives is around $25,000. Not much more than putting in a brand new furnace, which it I've really done. isn't right. Like this system does heating and air conditioning. I think often when you look at what a furnace would cost in that case, it's going to be at least 15,000. And then if you had to get air conditioning too, that's, you know, you're almost to 25 and the ground loops are going to last as long as the home. So like mm -hmm. you put the ground loops in, and that's a one-time cost. And then the heat pump should last 15 to 20 years. And when you replace it, it's much more like replacing an air conditioner than installing geothermal again. So net, net cost to customer about 25K. Uh, for those paying over time, it really just depends on the loan that the customer sure. is using. But I would say in the neighborhood of 200 to $300 a month is what we're seeing. So comparable to probably your heating bill, if, particularly if you're in the right. northeast and you're oil right. so expensive. Now, um, talk about the incentives a little bit. You have a combination of federal incentives and state incentives, which of course vary by state. Roughly how much incentive is available to a homeowner thinking about converting? It's quite a lot. And that's a huge advantage for people switching to geothermal. Um, so on the federal level, there's a 30% federal tax credit. So the government, the federal government will pay for 30% of the system. There are state tax credits in some states. So in New York, for example, there's a $5,000 state tax credit on top of that federal tax credit. And then the utilities in the regions where we work also have incentives. And these range from maybe $10,000 all the way up to $45,000. And I'm not exaggerating. Really? <laughs> there, are, there are utility incentives as high as $45,000 to support homeowners switching, which just shows you, again, the value that uh, utilities recognize in more homeowners switching to geothermal. I want to talk about that because that's a really interesting area to just dig into. But before we do, how does the geothermal heat pump change the value of a home? Have you done any analysis of, of the lift in value that it produces? I don't have good data on geothermal heat pumps and the change of value. I think a study was done on air source heat pumps that did show um, an increase in value to the home. And I could only imagine geo would be at least as good because it's a longer lasting, lower cost system in terms of operating cost. But I think uh, while this isn't data, just intuitively, when you think about the appeal of a home that has geothermal already installed versus a home that has fuel oil, where you have to deal with a contract with a fuel oil provider, you can understand how many homeowners <laughs> would be attracted to the idea of a low maintenance, low cost geo system. Now, you have partnered with utilities like Con Edison, National Grid, Central Huston, Hudson, uh, to evangelize these, these heat pumps. And let's dig into the benefits to them. We talked about the peak demand management. Yeah. Benefit. Are there other things that the utilities are looking at in terms of being relieved of some of the stresses on their infrastructure due to these heat pumps? We have a project with National Grid Utility where they... Um, 
have a section of natural gas pipeline to a neighborhood that needs to be repaired, mm -hmm. but they don't want to do the repair because it's very expensive. And the laws in New York are such that it's unlikely they'll be able to make back the cost of that repair because New York has indicated they want to wean New York off of natural gas. Right. So National Grid is partnering with us to retrofit those homes to full, fully electrify them so that they right. don't need that natural gas line. And that way they don't need to do the repair because the cost for them of, of electrifying the homes is actually more favorable than the cost of retrofitting the gas line and not being able to make it back. So you you really aren't seeing resistance to moving customers away from fossil fuels amongst the utilities, it sounds like. They're embracing this and rolling with it. It depends on the utility, right? It's a different utilities have different incentives. I think it really depends. Some are both electric and gas. Some utilities are only gas. And of course, uh, the strategic imperatives of those different cases are different. But in this case, I think for National Grid, you know, it's just a few houses that would have a disproportionate cost to mm -hmm. fix their gas line. So it just was very clear cut. We also see a lot of utilities starting to experiment with thermal networks. So the mm -hmm. utility will install the ground loops for a neighborhood. And then I think utilities are experimenting with that as a business model so that they can deliver thermal energy through geothermal instead of through natural gas, which could be a nice path for those utilities that are gas only, especially to have a future that isn't dependent on gas. And would they also potentially be able to leverage carbon credit benefits so they could monetize the decrease in carbon that they're generating in addition to the revenue from the customers in those loops? That's a good question. I do know that they are the the lawmakers in states like New York and Massachusetts have goals around decreasing the carbon emissions from utilities. And I do know that that is part of the value that they see in switching people to geothermal. They can show they're making progress in those carbon emission reductions, but I'm not an expert in this topic. So I'm not sure exactly how that factors Fair in. Enough. Now, it sounds like dandelion systems could be used in multifamily or office buildings based on what we've been talking about. Yeah. Are you going to be expanding to those markets as well? Well, I'll clarify that geothermal systems can certainly be used in any type of building, office, multifamily, you know, St. Patrick's Cathedral in Manhattan uses geothermal. It's really any building can use it. But yep. um, Dandelion offers our drilling services for any type of building because the ground loops are pretty similar across building types. Mm -hmm. We don't do the heat pump installation for buildings other than single family or maybe townhouses. We really stick to that just because that's our specialty, but yeah. lots of other companies could do geothermal in other types of buildings. So, so widening the aperture to geothermal generally, it sounds like in the context of our efforts to move to renewables across the board, this could play a critical role in lowering the, uh, the demand yes. on, on the grid. Can this be, I mean, we talked about the fact that technically it can be used anywhere, but are you looking at how this could stand in for air conditioning in regions that are experiencing extreme heat uh, along the equator, for instance? Well, we aren't personally looking into that as much. I think that there is a lot of potential there, especially um, in places where you could figure out how to put the loop infrastructure in, in a cost-effective way. That's really the key challenge is, can you find a model that works for people where it makes sense to pay up front for the loops and right. then benefit from them indefinitely, right? And I think a lot of homeowners make decisions based on upfront cost, which is yeah. not compatible with uh, investing in the loops up front to benefit over time. And the way that, I mean, this is a problem or not a problem, but just a characteristic of almost all renewable energy, which tends to cost a little bit more upfront, but then much less over time. And it's solved with financing. So I think yeah. um, I think we'll have to see like creative financing mechanisms to make that possible. 
Do you see uh, the, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, had a lot of incentives for renewables, but do you think policymakers, not just in the United States, but around the world, are thinking about how to create a an incentive program or at least a financing structure that would allow us to install these ground loops at scale? I think we're still in the early days. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm excited about the work that the utilities are doing. Eversource Utility, for example, in Massachusetts is doing one of the first utility scale ground loop, you know, district uh, projects. And I think as more utilities experiment with those types of things, mm -hmm. you know, we'll, the idea will spread. So I think we're still at the beginning, but it does seem like we're headed in that direction. Do you have a sense of the timeline for this transition in your head as you think about where you want the world to be? by say 2050, which of course is when we believe we have to be net neutral. Yeah. Well, I think we've seen with other renewable technologies that once they catch on, mm -hmm. the um, the uptake can be very, very fast. So I remember with electric vehicles, how, uh, you know, 10 years ago, it was an open question. And now, I mean, I, I live in the Bay Area, so I'm <laughs> it's not uh it's kind of a very specific look at the world but like it seems like every other vehicle is an electric vehicle I know I live in sort of the ground zero over electric vehicles but um it's definitely a trend that every major car company has their electric vehicle strategy everyone's talking about it and I think we're going there with heat pumps too so I bet I bet the transition will happen more quickly than we expect because they tend to do that um i think we tend to say huh is it going to happen is it going to happen and then a few years later wow that really happened quickly now so what advice would you give to a consumer homeowner who's considering switching what questions should they be asking whether it's the company they talk to or the utility about how they could get access to this sort of geothermal service yeah it's a great question I think that um, the most important thing for any heat pump installation, geo or air source, is which contractor you work with. The quality of the contractor is the number one thing I would pay attention to. If you get the right contractor, the heat pump will work well. And if, you know, if it doesn't, the contractor will take responsibility for ensuring that it does, right? And so I would look at, I would look for a contractor who's done a lot of projects in your area as that's often a sign that it's a reputable firm. Are there are there certifications that you would look for? Often the to get permits, to get mm -hmm. to be qualified for rebates, et cetera, contractors have to be have to have the correct certifications. So in most markets, if the contractor is qualified for rebates, they should they should be qualified to do the the project. Great advice. Thank you. Kathy, how can folks follow along with what uh, Dandelion Energy is doing? Well, dandelionenergy.com is a great way. And if you happen to live in New York, Massachusetts, or Connecticut, and are interested in learning more about if your home would be a good candidate, please come to our website. Um, we, for free, will give you a sense of what it would cost to to switch your house and be happy to talk to you about what it could look like. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, and it's been a pleasure talking. We appreciate you spending the time with us today. Thanks so much, Mitch. That was my conversation with the CEO of Dandelion Energy, Kathy Hannon. You can learn more about Dandelion Energy's geothermal heat pump solutions, which are currently available in New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts at dandelionenergy.com. Dandelion Energy, all one word, no space, no dash dandelionenergy.com. You know, installing a heat pump can put you on the fast track to a lower carbon footprint overall while creating significant savings on heating and cooling costs for your home. For instance, I have the personal experience of having just moved to a home with a heat pump and the savings during the first month we lived here, January, in the depths of winter were striking. With no gas bill, just the cost of electricity to run an air transfer heat pump, we saved about $180 this month on our, our our heating costs. 
geothermal technology, especially when shared ground loop infrastructures are in place so that you don't have to have the drilling done when your uh, system is installed, but you tap into that uh, shared ground loop, could unlock access to affordable heating and cooling in many regions. It's an intriguing possibility because utilities would retain their role as an infrastructure provider supporting the jobs that they create today while drastically lowering carb the, the carbon emissions of society and providing relief from extreme heat and cold for homeowners and apartment dwellers. I hope you take a moment to share this podcast or any of the more than 450 interviews that we've done on sustainability in your ear. If you take a moment to write a review on your favorite podcast platform, it will help your neighbors find us because, folks, you are the amplifiers that can spread more ideas that create less waste. Tell your friends, family, and coworkers that they can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Audible, or any of the fine purveyors of podcast goodness they prefer. Thank you for your support. I'm Mitch Radcliffe. This is Sustainability in Your Ear, and we will be back with another Innovator interview soon. In the meantime, folks, take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let's all take care of this beautiful planet of ours. Have a green day.